Welcome to Intermediate Financial Accounting 2 Tutorial 9b. This is the second of two tutorials focused on accounting for income taxes. This tutorial will continue with the Prometheus Limited example but now look at the year 2021 which includes a situation where we have a tax loss. This tutorial includes five learning objectives. The first will be to prepare a schedule to reconcile the accounting loss to a tax loss and to calculate the current income tax recoverable. Second will be to prepare a schedule to determine the ending deferred or future tax balances on the balance sheet and calculate any deferred or future tax expense or recovery. Third will be to prepare any relevant journal entries to record current and deferred or future income tax expense or recovery. The fourth learning objective will be to illustrate the preparation of a partial income statement showing provisions for current and future deferred income taxes. And fifth, to prepare a partial balance sheet showing income tax related accounts as they would appear under IFRS and ASPE. This tutorial will continue with the Prometheus Limited example. However, we'll now focus on the year 2021 for all elements. So, our first requirement will be to prepare a schedule to reconcile any accounting income to taxable income or loss of and to calculate the current income tax expense or recovery. And actually, in this case, we'll have a recovery. Remember, as demonstrated in the previous tutorial on deferred and future income tax, our first step is to reconcile our accounting income to our taxable income. Now, the difference with this tutorial is we now have a loss per the data. So we always begin with our accounting net income or loss. So from the data, we have 3 million in losses. Then we have a section for our permanent differences. So these are things that are either completely or partially non-taxable or non-deductible. The first thing we do is we add back our non-deductible golf club dues, $4,000. Then meals and entertainment is only 50% deductible. So what we must do then is, of course, add back the non-deductible portion of the meals and entertainment. From our data and our income statement showed $30,000 in meals and entertainment, 50% of which is not deductible, so we will add back $15,000. Finally, we have the situation where we sold an asset for $40,000 in proceeds, but the carrying value or net book value is 32. We have a gain on disposal, but gains and losses are not taxable or tax deductible. So because we have an accounting gain, we're going to subtract the non taxable accounting gain, $8,000. So now we can move on to any temporary differences. Our first set of temporary differences relate to accounting depreciation and CCA. As we've seen in the previous tutorial and in examples you've hopefully looked at, we're going to add back accounting depreciation because that's non-deductible, and we're going to subtract CCA, but guess what? In this case, CCA is zero. Why is CCA zero? Because we have a tax loss. And when you have a tax loss, the company won't deduct CCA. The whole point of taking CCA is to reduce your taxable income. Well, if your taxable income is already in a loss position, there's no point in taking additional CCA to further reduce your loss. That gives us a net of 45,000 on those differences. The next set of temporary differences we have relates to the interest expense on the bond. Remember, the interest on the bond is calculated using the effective rate approach. And so for accounting purposes, the uh, effective interest rate interest is 60,674. We can't deduct that, we have to add it back, but we can deduct the actual interest paid. And so the interest paid on that bond every year is $55,000. So we subtract that, giving us a net of 5674. And if you wanted to prepare an amortization table for the bond, this would be the actual amortization of the discount for the second year. Next, we have non-deductible patent costs that are expensed for accounting purposes. In the first year, the entire 100,000, if you recall, was taken for tax purposes, but not for accounting purposes. So now the first 60,000 of this is reversing. So we can add back the non-deductible patent costs for accounting that were deducted for tax purposes in 2020. And then finally, we have our warranty expense. 
we add back non-deductible warranty expense based on estimates. Remember the accounting warranty expense is an estimate and the government will not let you deduct estimates. So we add the estimate back, but we subtract the actual warranty costs incurred. So we take out 58,000 in costs incurred to service the warranties. And so that results in a net add back of $4,000. So when we take our net loss, factor in permanent differences, temporary differences, we now end up with a tax loss or tax deductible loss of $2,874,326. This last step here, actually what we're doing in this slide, as you can see, we're combining step one because we actually haven't quite finished. We've reconciled to the tax loss, but now what are we going to do with that loss? So I'm combining step one and step three here to create the journal entry for this since we have all the information in front of us. Carrying forward from the previous slide, the tax loss is $2,874,326. Now what we can do is carry that loss back to previous periods where we had taxable income and paid taxes. We can actually carry back three years. We will carry back to the oldest year first, so 2018, 2019, and 2020. Because if we don't apply it to 2018, then that's lost forever. Now from the data presented, taxes paid in 2018 and were 168,400. And that was at a tax rate of 40%. Now the data doesn't tell you what the taxable income was in that year, but if we take 168,000 and divide by 40%, you'll get 421,000. In 2019, the taxes paid were 271,936 at 40%. So if we take that and divide by 40%, the taxable income in that year had to be 679,840. And then finally, 2020, the taxes paid were 286,446, and that was based on taxable income of 818,417, but we can also back calculate that by dividing by 35%. So of the 2,874 tax loss, we can carry back these three amounts, which means this leaves 955,069 to carry forward. So we can call this a loss carry forward. And if we take that loss carry forward times the future enacted tax rate, which means that we're left with future income tax that's recoverable before tax is 955,069, and after tax is 315173 Then what we can do is prepare the journal entry to record the current income tax expense, but it's actually not income tax expense. It is income tax recovery. And the amount that we can recover is the sum of all of the taxes paid in those previous years. So 168400 plus 271936 plus 286446 is 726782 we're going to debit income tax receivable because the government is actually going to send you a check for that. And then we are going to credit current income tax recovery. This income tax receivable is on the balance sheet and this income tax recovery is on the income statement. The next requirement is to prepare a schedule to determine the ending deferred future tax income balances and to calculate any future or deferred income tax expense or recovery. All right, now that we've completed our reconciliation to taxable income, our second step will be our deferred tax or future tax calculations. Remember, deferred tax is IFRS and future tax relates to ASPE. So the first thing we need to do is a uh, calculation for deferred future tax for property, plant, and equipment. And we have a little schedule here, note one, that shows how we arrive at our ending balances. So the first thing we need is the tax base. Remember this table from the previous tutorial? Uh, so we start we're always with our tax base, which is the undepreciated capital cost. And we have this calculation here. The opening balance is a carry forward from the previous year. So 464,930 carried forward from previous year. We had an addition per the data of 60,000 in new assets. And then we had a disposal. We have a situation here where the proceeds were 40,000, but the original cost is 50,000. We always take out the lesser of cost or proceeds. The proceeds in this case are lower than the original cost, so we will subtract 40000 And there is no CCA because the company has a taxable loss. You will not claim CCA. So that gives us an ending balance of 484930 Then we calculate our accounting basis, which is basically our net book value. Down here, we had a carryover from the previous year, a book balance 
of $485,000. We add the $60,000 addition, but when we do disposals for accounting purposes, we remove the net book value. So we take out the $32,000 net book value, which is shown in the data, and we always depreciate assets. Our taxable situation has no impact on whether we record depreciation, so we'll deduct depreciation expense of $45,000, which gives us an ending balance of $468,000. So when we take our tax base of 484,930 minus $468,000, and remember that that's a debit, we end up with a debit balance of 16,930. Multiplied by the tax rate of 33% gives us an ending deferred or future tax balance of 5,587. So if we were to keep a T account, what this is doing is it's calculating our ending balance here of 5,587. But we have a beginning balance that carried over from the previous year of 7,025 credit. So in order to go from a credit balance of 7,025 to a debit balance of 5,587, we need an adjustment of 12,612. So we'll debit the deferred future tax account for 12,612 and end up crediting the income statement for 12,612. This is an area where students make a number of errors, so it's a good idea to keep a T account to show how we go from the beginning balance of 7025 credit balance to an ending balance of a debit. The next item here relates to the warranty. Our tax base, or UCC, is zero, and the reason for that, as I described in the previous tutorial, all items except for PPE and other types of intangibles or anything that's tracked for CCA that has an amount that has yet to be deducted in the future. Basically, the reason why PPE has a UCC balance is because the government will not let you deduct all of the cost to purchase the equipment. With expenses like warranty and pensions, the only amount that you can deduct are the actual costs incurred. So there's 100% deductibility up front for those. Then we have our accounting base shown here in note two. If we were to duplicate a T account for the warranty liability on the balance sheet, we had a $24,000 balance from the year before credit. Then we add the warranty expense, it's an estimate and we would have debited warranty expense for 62,000 and credited the liability for 62,000. Then we would have to take out the actual costs incurred. We would credit cash or an inventory or anything like that and take out $58,000. Costs incurred leaves us with a balance of 28,000. It's a liability account, so it's a credit. Then if we take our zero minus a negative, gives us a $28,000 debit times the 33% tax rate, gives us a $9,240 ending deferred tax debit balance. And we have a beginning balance in that deferred account of 8,400. So to go from a beginning balance of 8,400 to an ending balance of 9,240 means we need an adjustment of $840. If you think you need a T account for that, then you should create one. Deferred income tax for warranty. We had an $8,400 debit balance to begin with. We need an ending balance of $9,240. So that means an $840 debit to the deferred tax balance for warranty. And it happens to be an asset. And the opposing credit will be to the income statement. Our next item has to do with the patent costs. Again, the UCC is zero because that was all deducted for tax purposes when claimed. So that means all we have left is an accounting base number. If we were to recreate the T account for the patent, all of it was deductible for tax purposes, but none of it was deductible for accounting purposes. And the company decided to spread it out 60,000 in 2021 and the remainder in 2022. So there was a beginning balance of 100,000. 60,000 is now expensed this year, leaving us with a balance of 40,000. So zero minus 40 is negative 40 and becomes negative. So now we have a liability. It's a credit balance times 33% gives us an ending deferred tax account balance of 13,200. If the beginning balance was $35,000 credit, we have an ending balance that we want of 13,000 
200. The beginning balance was 35,000. So in order to go from 35 down to 13.2, we need a debit of 21,800. So debit, the deferred patent a liability account, we know it's a liability because it has a credit balance, we're debiting it, and then a credit to the income statement. Our next item has to do with the bond amortization. And we've got our third note to help us with that. Again, tax base is zero because the actual interest paid is the amount that's fully deductible. So we're left with an accounting base number. If you previewed the previous tutorial, the balance in the bond discount would be 5,327. Then uh, remember for tax purposes, we have to remove the interest expense at the effective rate. So we have to take out 60,674 and then we can add in the interest paid of 55,000. So that results in an ending balance of 11,001. Zero minus a negative becomes a positive. So this is a debit balance. Therefore, it's an asset. So 11,001 times 33% equals 3630. This is the ending balance. We have a beginning balance of 1865. So we need to debit that T account for 1,766. And we would credit the income statement account, the tax account for 1,766. Our last item is that loss carry forward. We can include this in the table because we can track everything for which there's a difference for in our table. Zero tax base, because everything except PPE has a zero balance. And we had a loss carry forward before tax. So the amount of tax losses to be carried forward is $955,069. Take zero minus that negative equals 955069 This is an asset. It's a debit balance, so equals an asset. And hopefully this makes sense. It's an asset because you get future deductibility. So that times 33% is an ending balance in a loss carry forward account, a deferred tax for loss carry forward of 315173 this is new, so the beginning balance is zero. So we need a debit of 315173 to the deferred income tax asset account and a credit to the income statement. Our third requirement here is to prepare the journal entries to record the current year tax expense, which we did already actually, but I'll show it here again, and any deferred or future income tax expense or recovery. Now the first entry we already did, and that was to record the current income tax expense or recovery. So we don't need to go over how this entry was arrived at. We already did that as part of the reconciliation to taxable income. The most important part here is the entry to record the deferred or future tax amounts. I gave you a smaller version of the table that we had before down here, and, and you can see that we're going to have a total value of adjustments of 352,191. The benefit of doing the table and this last column here shows all of the individual debits or credits that are necessary to comprise the journal entry. Column seven are the adjustments to the deferred or future tax accounts, and then column eight happens to be for the income statement. Each of these can be done in one entry, or you can do them as a combined entry like I'm doing here. So it just so happens with this example, all of the adjustments to the future tax or deferred tax accounts are all debits. So we have a debit, to the DIT account for property, plant, and equipment for 12,612, a debit to the DIT FIT account for warranty for 840. I'm using the term asset or liability in these based on what the ending balance is. So you can see down here in column four, because we know that the PPE balance is going to be a debit, so that means that this is an asset. The warranty is an asset account. The patent is a liability account. So that's why I'm using the word liability here. So we're going to, but we still put a debit to it, right? Because that's the adjustment necessary. So we'll debit the DIT liability for 21,800. We're going to also debit the DIT asset account for bonds for 1,766. And then the last item is a debit to the DIT loss carry forward account for 315,173. To offset all of those amounts, we have one adjustment to the DIT FIT expense or benefit because this results in a net credit. So we're going to call it a benefit. If these were net debits, we would call it deferred tax expense. 
We don't use the word recovery for this because we're not actually recovering it. We use a recovery as part of the current tax expense because we will recover taxes actually paid. But when it comes to future tax, we use the term benefit. So we have a total uh, value of credits to the income statement of 352,191. Our next requirement will be to prepare a partial income statement, beginning with accounting net income and including any provisions for current and deferred future income taxes. Now step four is to show what a partial income statement would look like. For Prometheus Limited, our partial IFRS or ASPE income statement for the year in December 31st, we show our loss before income taxes, $3 million accounting loss, and then we have a section that's a provision for all income taxes or recovery in the case of a negative balance. So what we have here are current income tax recovery, of 726,782, so that's why we put brackets around it, and then deferred for IFRS, future for ASPE, tax benefit of 352,191. So the net loss recorded on the income statement for accounting purposes is 1,921,027. Our last requirement will be to prepare a partial statement of financial position or a balance sheet showing what the income tax related accounts would look like under IFRS and ASPE. So our next step is to prepare a partial balance sheet. So we'll start with the ASPE balance sheet first because it's the most complicated. So as at December 31st, our partial balance sheet for ASPE consists of current assets of income tax receivable of 726,782. Then what we must do is report any long-term assets or liabilities or current assets or liabilities, but the, the way this is presented, you have to be, pay very close attention to. ASPE requires the reporting of only current assets or current liabilities for future tax and either a long-term asset or long-term liability for future taxes. So what has to happen is we net out any long-term future tax asset and liabilities and net out any current future tax asset and liabilities. So even though the future tax account for warranty is an asset of 9,240, the liability for patent, the future tax liability balance for the patent is 13,200. So we net those two out. So that's why I'm skipping ahead from the long-term assets and going straight to current liabilities just to make sure that we can get this out of the way. So we'll net out the current liabilities against the current assets and report a net current liability of 3,960, which then leaves us with long-term assets. So again, when we look at all of these items, column five here, we know that PPE is long-term, warranty in this particular case is current, the patents are considered to be current, the bonds are long-term items and the loss carry forward is long-term because it'll take more than one year to recover them. What we have here then is a long-term future tax asset for property plant equipment of 5,587, a long-term asset for bonds of 3,630, and a long-term asset for the loss carry forward of 315,173. There are no long-term liability accounts in this case, but if there were, we would offset them and whichever would be bigger than a debit or credit would be what we would show on the balance sheet. So in this case, we have debit balances for long-term future tax assets of 324,390. Then the last one is the IFRS balance sheet, which is very easy. We still show whatever the current asset or liability that would be related to the current income tax expense or recovery. So in this case, we have recovery, and that means the government is going to have to pay the company back. So current asset, income tax receivable, 726782 But under IFRS, all deferred tax accounts or amounts are considered to be long-term. It doesn't matter what they are individually. This entire balance the sum of all of the ending balances of the individual deferred tax accounts equals 320,430. And they're all considered to be long-term. So because we have a net debit balance, which is an asset, we will report deferred income taxes under long-term assets of 320,430. So you see the difference side by side of the ASPE balance sheet versus the IFRS. The IFRS just looks at the total of all of the future tax accounts 
whether their assets or liabilities takes the net amount and in this case it's an asset so we're recorded as a long-term asset whereas ASPE has to split out and report current assets or liabilities and long-term assets slash liabilities separately. Okay, so let's wrap up now with some key points to remember. We can solve accounting for income tax problems with five steps. The first is that reconciliation from accounting income to taxable income, or in our situation, right from an accounting loss to a tax loss. We would calculate deferred or future tax balances and adjustments, and that's best accomplished through a table. The third step is to do the journal entries. We would get the current income tax expense or recovery off of the reconciliation, so step one. And we would get the uh, amounts for the deferred future income tax expenses or recoveries from step two. The fourth step would be to prepare an income statement, and the last step, a partial balance sheet. Then, if we have a situation where we have tax losses, remember they can be carried back three years and applied against any previous taxable income. Any income tax paid in those previous years against which the loss is carried back is recoverable, of course, based on their appropriate historical rates. It's these three items here that are fully recoverable. With any unused tax losses, we can carry those forward indefinitely as a loss carry forward or LCF. Now, there are certain exceptions to those. Management has to determine that it's probable or more likely than not that they will use those future tax losses against future income. If the company does not foresee that it's going to be profitable, then you can't set up a future tax asset that will never be used. Make sure that you review any of those requirements to assess whether or not you can use the loss carry forward based on expectations for future taxable income. That deferred or future income tax asset is a loss carry forward. It's calculated using the appropriate enacted tax rate. So here we had before tax losses that could be carried forward of 955.069 times the tax rate gave us future income tax recoverable loss carry forward of 315.173 and that was what we saw in our table. When doing a deferred or future tax, consider creating a table. Remember that the tax basis minus the accounting basis times that future enacted tax rate gives you that ending balance on the balance sheet. And if you have an ending balance, it's a debit, it's an asset. If it's a credit, it's a liability. We take that ending deferred future tax balance minus the beginning balance will give you the required adjustment. Remember, if you have to keep track of your positives and negatives, because if you're going from a debit balance to a credit balance, you've got to basically add the two together or subtract a negative. Next step, when you've got your journal entries, they include the current income tax expense or recovery, along with any current income tax payable or receivable. So you have an income statement impact and a balance sheet impact. Your journal entries will also include a, an adjustment to a deferred income tax expense or benefit and an associated deferred income tax liability or asset. When we do the partial income statement, it should be prepared using the intra-period tax allocation format, which we've shown that starts with your accounting income before taxes or loss, if it's the case. And then we have a separate little section that shows provisions for current and future income tax separately. For our partial balance sheet, we should always make sure that we include the associated income tax payable or receivable account, and that's always going to be current. If we're looking at a long-term deferred income tax asset, of course, or liability under IFRS, they're all classified as long-term, and we cannot net out long-term assets against long-term liabilities. So under IFRS, you can conceivably show a long-term asset and a long-term liability. If we have current future tax assets or current future tax liabilities under ASPE, then they can all be knitted out against each other. So the current FIT assets and liabilities can be offset against each other. And on long-term future tax assets or liabilities under ASPE, those can also be netted or offset against each other. So this concludes tutorial 9b. We hope you found it informative and useful. Thanks for watching.